Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag here on the AMC Movie News YouTube channel. My name is John Camby. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and this is the show, AMC Mailbag, where all we do is take your mailbag question. This is the much more laid-back, more relaxed and formal. We go behind the scenes a little bit and just, just talk in movies. I'm going to let you know, too, guys, if you've got a questions or a topic or a comment you'd like us to have on AMC Mailbag, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk.com at gmail.com and maybe we'll answer your question on AMC Mailbag maybe it'll get on AMC Movie Talk write on in your question take a chance and let's see what turns out so um, today is going to be a little bit different normally what happens with Mailbag is the questions get run by me first and I approve them and, and I know what the questions are in advance today I, uh, I have uh, purposely not looked at the questions today so I don't know what the questions are going to be so this is going to kind of like be the viewer uh, Twitter question part of AMC Movie Talk where I don't know what the question is. So this will be a little bit different. I feel a little naked, uh, unprepared. I, I am indeed wearing pants though, so mark that one for me. Big score for me. Remember to wear pants today. That is a step in the right direction. A little step, friends. Little steps. All right, so without any further ado, let's get into the first question. And the first question today comes to us from Max Ganter, who writes... <coughs> Hey, MC Movie Crew, just wanted to know your thoughts. What MCU movie did you like the least? Personally, I think Thor The Dark World was the worst, and it really stinks because I thought the first one was great. Anyway, just wanted to hear thoughts. Thanks, and bring on the filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Max. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned Thor. Yeah, actually, before Captain America The Winter Soldier... Thor, the first Thor, was actually my favorite of the standalone Marvel films, uh, even more than than Iron Man one. I, there's just something about the first Thor, directed by Kenneth Branagh, that I thought was really special, and it just it worked for me on just about every level. I mean, the love interest, nah, that didn't work for me. The Natalie Portman character has pretty much been. I wish they had just gotten rid of that whole character um, for both movies, from Thor and Thor two, as a matter of fact. But but uh, whatever, she's there. But besides that. I just adored the first one. I even liked the second one. I didn't like it anywhere near as good as the first one. And it's not in my top three favorite um, Marvel standalone films. But I still liked it. I enjoyed it. But it had a lot more weaknesses in the first one, admittedly. To me, I think the worst of the Marvel standalone films, or any of the Marvel films so far, has been Iron Man 2. I really thought that movie was just one big hot mess. Um, it wasn't completely dreadful. It wasn't completely horrible, but it was a bad film. It was. It had a couple of redeeming qualities, which I think keeps it from being considered a horrible movie. But um, overall, really disappointing. I, I didn't think they did anything right. I didn't like the way they set up uh, Rhodey getting the war machine armor. I didn't like the way they utilized. Uh, uh, well, almost any of the characters, really. Like, I, I just did not like the way they handled almost anything in that movie. The one really big redeeming quality to me, and Mickey Rourke was terrible in it. Um, you know, I and I used to think he was okay in it, and and I thought he just kind of mailed it in. But I've watched Iron Man two now a few more times, and I thought, you know what? No, he didn't just mail it in. He's actually pretty bad in this. Um, <clears throat> one of the redeeming qualities was some of the action was pretty good, but. As is the strength in any movie that they're in together, I, I thought the the chemistry between Gwyneth Paltrow and Robert Downey Jr. was pretty good, so I like that. Um, but but still, I think the worst. Now, some people will want to say, "Well, John, that first um, that first Hulk movie, the one with Eric Bana, you got to consider that the worst one." But you got to remember that one technically was not a Marvel film. Um, I think it was Universal that did that. This was before Marvel had their own studio, I believe. Um, so you can't actually count that one. So since we can't count that one, I'm going to say Iron Man 2 for me uh, was my least favorite of them. and uh, Which is too bad because we all love Iron Man 1. And I even like Iron Man 3. I know a lot of people had big problems and compl under believe me, I understand why some people really did not like Iron Man 3. You know there are some movies you love that you just can't understand why people didn't love them? Well Iron Man 3 is one I liked. I liked quite a bit actually. But I can understand the people who felt a little bit bait and switched uh, with the whole Mandarin thing. I get it. I do. I, I, I'm not, and I'm not going to tell anybody they shouldn't be upset about that. 
All I can say for me is I found it to be a pretty interesting twist and kind of funny. And, uh, and, and I left having had a good time. So that was me. But yes, my least favorite of the Marvel Cinematic Universe so far has got to be Iron Man 2. All right, let's move on to the next blind question today. And the next blind question today comes to us from Javier Vasquez, who writes, Greetings from Puerto Rico, my friends. Well, greetings to you, Javier. Uh, love the show. Never miss it. I just saw the trailer for this futuristic sci-fi movie called, oh, called Automata, uh, starring Antonio Banderas and Melanie Griffith. And it looked amazing. Have you seen it? And what are your thoughts and expectations for this movie? Um, as a matter of fact, Javier, I just saw that trailer for the first time, I think on Friday, no, Thursday. <coughs> Thursday was the first time I saw uh, the Autonoma trailer. And... I'll be honest with you, you mentioned Melanie Griffith. I didn't know Melanie Griffith was, was in it. So who knew? I didn't I didn't realize many, Melanie Griffith was in it. But um, it looks fantastic. It looks really good. It looks like a much darker and deeper version of iRobot. Um, you'd almost think somebody was making an iRobot remake or reboot. Um, but it is a darker feeling. It is a grittier feeling. It is a deeper feeling. It feels like the narrative goes more deeper and philosophical um, uh, than it. And I would highly encourage you look up the uh, the trailer if you have a chance to check it out. Because, and I think Banderas looks awesome in it. Uh, I actually thought Antonio Banderas was a, was again one of the big bright spots of Expendables three. You know, I talked the other day about uh, Expendables three about how I don't think it's as bad as some people were making it out to be. I, I think it had some very big bright spots. As a matter of fact, uh, w was it overall that good? No, it wasn't all that good. Was it as good as Expendables two? No, it wasn't as good as Expendables two. But I, I didn't find it to be a big piece of trash. And one of the things that I've really highlighted, I thought was great, and it was Mel Gibson. If they had an Oscar category for best acting in a single scene. I'm telling you, Mel Gibson would walk away with that Academy Award this year. Because there's a scene in Expendables where he's in a van, tied up, or he's handcuffed in a van. That's all I'll say, for those of you who haven't seen it yet. But those of you who have seen it, you know the scene I'm talking about. Where he gives us like three or four minute long monologue. And it's just riveting. It's so good. His performance in that scene is amazing. His performance in the whole movie is really good. Um... And, but Antonio Banderas uh, was really more the comic relief and stuff, but he did his action sequence was fantastic. His comedy was really good. I found myself falling in love with that character. I thought he was great. Anyway, we're not talking about Expendables 3. Uh, Autonoma. Um, actually, I don't even think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, how is it pronounced? Automata. Automata. Okay. Um, so look it up because... And I say it feels like a deeper version of iRobot because, you know, the robots even structurally kind of look the same. The faces and all look completely different. But, um, you know, they've got the rules. You know, remember in iRobot, they each had those directives that they had to follow. Well, these robots have those too. But what happens when they don't really start following them and they start to evolve? And it's, it, it looks fascinating. And, and I'm really excited about it. So I'm really glad you bring that up, Javier, because I don't think we mentioned it on AMC Movie Talk this week. Um, so if you are somebody who's not seen the trailer for the Antonio Banderas film, Automata, I highly recommend that you take a minute, uh, go up to the search bar on YouTube after you're done watching AMC Mailbag, uh, and search for that trailer. And I do not think you will be disappointed. All right, <clears throat> let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Mackenzie, just Mackenzie. And Mackenzie writes, Hey, sons and daughters of AMC. Hey, John, I was recently watching the movie John Carter and overall thought it was a pretty decent movie for a sci-fi film. I really liked Lynn Collins in the movie. Do you think that she could have made a good Wonder Woman in Batman vs. Superman? I know she's a way better actress than, <laughs> than Gal Gadot is, right? Um, and watching John Carter, she's definitely got the look. She's gorgeous. Thanks and keep up the good work. Um, well, thank you so much for the um, uh, message, Mackenzie. Couple points. I'm so glad you watched John Carter. I think John Carter. I don't think John Carter is a pretty decent movie. I think John Carter is a great movie. I think it's great sci-fi. I, I I think that movie. Um, uh, other than maybe Edge of Tomorrow suffered from one of the worst marketing campaigns. It's a terrible title, John Carter. It's a terrible title for that movie. Um, I think it confused a lot of people. Nobody really knew what the movie was about or what they were getting into. And, and it, the movie just bombed. Well, I mean, it didn't bomb bomb. It made over $200 million. But 
I mean, it, it lost them a lot of money. Let's put it that way. Lost the studio a lot of money. And cost them what could have been a franchise. They planned on making more John Carter movies. More of Mars movies. Um, and it's really too bad that they didn't because I thought it was very creative, very imaginative, very pure sci-fi. Uh, and I loved it. I thought it was a really fun movie. And I'm sad they're not doing another one, but I completely understand why they're not because they botched it so bad the first time, the marketing anyway, that nobody went to go see it again. Um, and then you bring up Lynn Collins. Lynn Collins plays, uh, you know, the Princess of Mars, if you will, in the film. And she is really good in it. She's solid, beautiful. Um, there's a scene in that movie where she's wearing a certain bridal outfit. And a lot of us at the junket, when we first saw the film, we we're like, you know, if this movie's a big hit, that scene could be the new Princess Leia slave outfit scene. Because if you've seen the movie, you know, Lynn Collins just looks dynamite in that gown that she's wearing anyway um but could she have been a good wonder woman i'm gonna go out on a limb and say no is she a better actress than gal is yes yeah, she's a better actress than gal but um at the same time i believe lynn collins now is either 38 or 39 years old she's almost 40 by the time the first batman versus superman movie by the time batman versus superman comes out lynn collins will be 40 or 41 and well, that is fine to play Wonder Woman at that age. I don't think it's where you start playing Wonder Woman. I don't think you start your Wonder Woman arc and your Wonder Woman franchise as a 39, 40, 41 year old. I just don't think you can do it. Now, you say, well, John, they're doing that with Ben Affleck. Yeah, but, but that's what the character is supposed to be. Remember, they said they wanted this Batman in this universe to be a veteran, to be war-weary, weary, to have been experienced. He's been Batman for a long time. And if that's the case, then you got to go with like a 40-year-old dude. With Wonder Woman, I think it's a different case. Now, I'm totally cool if some of you disagree with me on that. That's totally cool. And I'm sure there are many, many valid uh, arguments to be had that why it's totally cool for to even start a Wonder Woman franchise with a 38 to 40-year-old woman. That's totally cool. Fine. I'm not going to try to refute any of them. I'm just saying that my first impression, my first reaction uh, to that is probably not the best idea. Because you'd like somebody who could be this role for, for a good 10 years or so at least. Maybe even 12 years over the course of maybe four or five movies in theory. And I just don't think you can be making a Wonder Woman with a 50-year-old at that point. Um, I mean, but even then it depends on, <coughs> on if you wrote a different kind of Wonder Woman. Like, if you wrote it so Wonder Woman has been Wonder Woman for 20 or 30 years already, then that's fine. But if they're going the route that it looks like they're going, and they're going a more traditional, young Wonder Woman, then I think you got to go somebody in their, in their mid to late 20s, maybe even early, early 30s. Um, but, but at Lily Collins' age, I think this is just a little bit old to start a Wonder Woman franchise. A one-shot Wonder Woman movie with no plans for franchise, I'm on board. I totally would be on board with Lil Collins playing that. Um, but outside of that, yeah, me, like I'm saying, it's just my personal answer to it. Just me. I personally just don't see it. All right. Let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes from Brian Stisher, who writes, I have a question. I hope you will find it interesting. Well, I'm intrigued already, Brian. Let's suppose you have been offered the chance to run a movie studio over the next 20 years. Taking into account multiple factors, including, but not limited to, franchise properties, room for growth, recent track record, marketing strategies, etc. Which movie studio would you choose to control? Um, <coughs> wow, uh, Brian, that's actually a pretty damn solid question. That's a, All right, well, let me tell you, um, I think everybody's first reaction would be to say Disney. Um, because right now Disney has all the momentum. They got all the money. They got all the big franchises. They got Marvel. They've got Star Wars. They've got all the big franchises, unlimited, well, almost unlimited resources. Um, so I think a lot of people would go with the sexy pick and that's Disney, but I'm going to come at this from a sports analogy point of view. Um, 
I think if you're coming in as a coach to run a team, the team you want to take over is not the team that just won the title three years in a row. Because there's nowhere to go but down. I would rather step in and take over a team that's doing really badly right now but has a storied history. Because if you can go into that town and take over that struggling team that has a really rich history, but they're struggling right now, and turn them around, then you're a hero. And you're an icon. And you're immortal. With that being in mind, I would not take over Disney because there's nowhere to go but down <laughs> for Disney. Because Disney is, is, is the three-time defending champion. Disney is wearing the belt right now. Disney is on top of the hill. So you take that over and you just continue to do great. Well, whatever. You just took over a majorly successful studio anyway. So it's not like you did a great job. The studio I would want to take over right now is actually Paramount. I would take over Paramount Studios because few studios have as rich and as glorious of a history as Paramount. They have a, just a wildly successful and wonderfully rich history. And they're kind of struggling right now. Um, Transformers notwithstanding, um, they're struggling for putting out decent quality movies at, right now. Uh, they are. They're struggling. It's not that I've lost faith in Paramount. Heaven forbid. No, I'm just saying. They, the last four or five years have not been banner years for Paramount, other than the, trans, the financial success of the Transformers franchise. Um, and so I think if I had the choice right now to take over any studio, that would be Paramount. Why? Because they have a rich history and because if I took over Paramount and I was able to turn it around within the first three or four years and really return it to absolute prominence like King of the Hill status again, I would be a Hollywood icon forever. I'd be the Steve Jobs of the movie studio world. Um, now that wouldn't happen with me because I'm stupid and I would run Paramount into the ground. Uh, but that being said, it would still be the one I would take over because if I succeeded, it would be a magnificent story. Whereas with Disney, even if I succeeded with Disney, it would just look like business as usual. And really more than likely it would drop in quality and I'd be the guy to blame. Right? So, uh, that's why I will go against the sexy pick and do that. Now, once again, guys, just, you know, fighting the cough, so I'm, I have lozenges that I need to suck on so I don't cough too much. So I know it's a little bit annoying that, that I've got the candy in my mouth, but I need it so I don't cough too much. So please forgive me for that. All right, let's go on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Dwight. And Dwight writes, Does Hollywood have a responsibility to be conscious of the fact that they are one, if not the biggest influence on society and the way we perceive it ought to be? My question is, do the big wigs and the mouse, I guess that means Disney, have to face the facts that they have a strong grip on the wheel and ease up? Uh, how much are politics and how much of it is art? Thank you, AMC. Keep up the good work. Um, well, first of all, Dwight, I, I have to disagree when you say that they have the biggest influence on society right now. I, I don't believe they do. I, I believe if any pop culture outlet has more influence than anybody else. I'd say it's probably the music industry has, has more influence than, say, uh, television or movies do. Um, so I would start there. But, but I understand you're saying, even if it's not the biggest one, it's one of the biggest ones. And, and sure, movies have a big influence over pop culture and, and our society and things like that. I'm not going to deny that. I do. And you know what? I'm going to say the really unpopular thing. No. I don't believe the movie industry has any responsibility when it comes to what kind of message does Hollywood send and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe they have any responsibility as far as that goes. They have one responsibility as a business and that one responsibility is to make money. That's the responsibility a business has. Now you want to obey the laws. You want to act fairly. You want to act ethically and all that kind of stuff. Yes, 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 yes. But when it comes to, do they have a responsibility? I'm going to say no. And look, I'm going to say this too. I find it, it is common amongst us folks, uh, us as, as, a, as a society, that we love to put responsibility on other people. 
We love talking about responsibility and who has obligations when it's somebody else. Um, we don't like to say that we are the ones responsible for this and we need to do this. And No, no, but we love talking about obligations and responsibility when it's other people that we're talking about supposedly needing to have those obligations and those responsibilities. Um, but I'm going to say, no, I think a studio has a responsibility to put out the best movies they can to try to make as much money as they can. And ultimately, I, I say this all the time. Studios really don't care about politics. I think sometimes they pretend they do and they like to let us think that they do. But I don't really think they give a crap about politics. I think, uh, and I said this before, if 20 years ago, if studios thought that making movies, I mean, they don't, they don't care about, I don't think studios care about the equality of gay rights in our country. I don't think they care. But that being said, and I certainly don't think they cared 20 years ago. But I think if 20 years ago, if they believe that making movies about, about um, sexual equality and uh, all that kind of stuff and equal rights and things like that, if they thought that making movies about that kind of stuff would make money, I guarantee you they would have been making those movies 20 years ago. In droves, they would have been making those movies. And I think the studios are just reactionary to what the trends of the society are. They see what is popular, what is trending, if you will, and they'll want to hop on that bandwagon. They'll want to hop on that gravy train, if you will. And ultimately, really, I said this before, what kind of responsibility? I don't want movies preaching at me. I don't want a movie to preach at me telling me what I'm supposed to think. I don't want Hollywood to take on the responsibility and the mantle of telling me what my moral code should be. That's for me to decide. You just tell a story. Let me take from it what I want to take from it. You just tell your stories. Don't preach to me. Don't tell me what I'm, don't tell me I'm supposed to be Democrat or conservative. Don't tell me if I'm supposed to think this way or that way. Just tell your damn story. My great example of this is remember the million dollar baby the great film by clint eastwood well if you've seen million dollar baby you know how it ends clint eastwood does something that um is very divisive amongst people and i remember a lot of people saying there was protests even about around clint eastwood when he would go to places after million dollar baby um saying that you know uh clint eastwood hates handicapped people because, okay, a little bit of a spoiler, but heavens, if you haven't watched Million Dollar Baby by now, a little bit of a spoiler, plug your ears for 30 seconds if you don't want to hear the end of Million Dollar Baby, okay? Go, plug your ears now. Okay, so Million Dollar Baby, you remember Clint Eastwood, um, the girl he's been training boxing is now uh, paralyzed for the rest of her life, and she wants to die, and he helps her commit suicide. Okay. Unplug your ears. Okay, so now those who wanted to hear how that ended, hear, heard how it ended. So a lot of people were very upset with Clint Eastwood because of what the character did. And they took it as if that's Clint Eastwood telling everybody that um, handicapped, physically handicapped people aren't worth living, aren't worth letting survive. They should just die. That's what Clint Eastwood's message is. And I always thought, okay, number one, you're all idiots. Um, number two, Clint Eastwood did not tell a story about what you should do. He didn't even tell a story about what he thought that character should have done. He told a story about a certain character and what they did in the midst of a difficult situation. Since when is watching somebody do something means that's what people should do and think? No. He just told a story about one particular guy who happened to do things a certain way. And he leaves it to us as an audience to react and feel about what he did, to agree with what the character did or disagree with what the character did, to draw our own conclusions. The idea was to make us feel and it, it, the idea was to make us think about it. It wasn't Clint Eastwood saying, this is how you should think about this. Look at the character in the movie. That is how you should be. That wasn't what Clint Eastwood was doing. He told a story with characters who are flawed and human and make mistakes like all of us. 
And that flawed human character made a decision in the film and never told us, never said to us as the audience, this is what you should not do or this is what you should do. Just told a story about a guy who made a certain decision. And then it's up to us to react to it in different ways. And that's what a good film should do. Should Hollywood take on the responsibility of teaching the moral code? No, because they're not qualified to do it, number one. And I don't want anybody telling me what my moral code should be. You know, I want that to be for me to decide. Hold up certain moral codes. Let me hear the different moral codes that are out there and whatever. And tell stories about characters who have certain moral codes and other characters who have different moral codes. And let me form my own. I don't want Hollywood taking that place and telling me what to do, good or bad. I don't want them telling me what I should do or think. So no, I, I have to disagree with you, Dwight. I don't think that Hollywood should take on that responsibility, should feel responsible for it in any way, shape, or form. They should just tell stories. Just tell stories. And then let the responsibility be where it should be on us as individuals to decide how to interpret those stories, what to do with those stories, agree or disagree with the stories, whatever. Just let it become a, a part of our experience. But ultimately, the responsibility is with us. It is not with Hollywood, nor should Hollywood try to take that thing. And you may feel differently about that, and that's totally cool if you do. Write on in into the comment section of this video and let me know your thoughts about, hey, John, I disagree with you on that because of A, B, C, and D. By all means, I'd love to hear your point of view on that. All right, anyway. Let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Paulo Semedo, who writes, Hey guys and gals of AMC, love your show. Thanks so much, Paulo. Uh, I've been watching it at work every day for months now. Well, maybe you shouldn't watch it at work, but yeah, no, screw it. Watch us at work. That's a great idea. Uh, my question is, what are your top three trilogies of all time? Ooh, mine are The Dark Knight, Back to the Future, and the Lord of the Rings. Thanks, and bring on the sweet, juicy, filthy. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the question, Paul. Um, you know, I remember, uh, it's a great question. Uh, what is the greatest trilogies of all time? I remember this came up once, and I'm going to give my list here in a second. The reason I remember this is because um, last year, somebody asked, do you consider the Dark Knight trilogy be the best trilogy of all time. And I stopped and I thought about it for a second. And I knew it wasn't going to be number one. And I knew it wasn't going to be number two. And I just assumed maybe it would be number three. But then I stopped. And I went, you know what? I'm, I'm not even sure as good as the Dark Knight trilogy is. Now, everybody knows I didn't completely love The Dark Knight Rises. But I do completely love The Dark Knight. And I completely love Batman Begins. Um, but I'm not even sure... The Dark Knight Trilogy is in the top five. So my top three would be this. Obviously, the king of all is the original Star Wars trilogy. That's the king. Um, then there would be probably the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And third, and this will surprise a lot of people, but think about it. Third is Toy Story. No trilogy in history has ever been as well-reviewed. I believe Toy Story 2 is still one of the only wide-release films in history to have 100%. Still have a 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Can't think of many wide-release films uh, that have that and maintain it. I'm sure there are a couple. Um, but the first Toy Story, Toy Story the sec I mean, just think about it this way. You know what a masterpiece the first Toy Story is. And it might very well be the worst of the trilogy. That's how good that trilogy is. The first Toy Story is amongst the greats. As a standalone film, it is amongst the greats. And it's probably the worst of the franchise. That's how good it is. So, I know some people get up in arms. Oh, John, it's a cartoon. I don't care. I don't care if it's a cartoon. I don't care if it's stop motion animation. I don't care if it's live action. A good damn movie is a good damn movie. And Toy Story trilogy, they are all tens they're all tens across the board um and there's some great trilogies out there i mean then you got to consider the godfather trilogy i mean one of the only franchises in history other than lord of the rings were all three all three films were nominated for best picture and two of them won best picture so there's the godfather then as you mentioned there's back to the future and there are others i mean there, there are some great 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 
uh, trilogy is not that. And of course, the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy is absolutely one of the greats. So my top three would be, and it's so, it feels so weird leaving the Godfather trilogy out of this, but my top three would be Star Wars, uh, King of them all, always will be, uh, Lord of the Rings, and the Toy Story trilogy. So uh, those are mine. I'd love to hear. Jump in the, in the comment section. Let me know your top three, guys. All right, got a couple more we got to get through here. Two more to go, it looks like. So we will go now to the question from Dean Ralph. And Dean Ralph writes, Hi, you guys. Love the show. And I'm from the UK and watch it every day on my launch. I, I'm going to guess he meant lunch. Uh, and my question is, does it annoy you when they change movies from the comic book? And which one did you hate? Mine is Juggernaut is a mutant and not his... And and his not and he's not Charles Xavier's half brother. Um, well, Dean, first of all, for those of you who don't know, in the comic books, uh, Juggernaut, um, which we saw in X Men Three, yeah, X Men: The Last Stand. We saw Juggernaut in X Men: The Last Stand. In the comic book, he's actually Charles Xavier's half brother. And clearly, and obviously, they did not take that route uh, in the movie. Um, I say this all the time, Dean, I'll, I'll say it here again. Making changes from the comic books to the movies does not bother me in the least. Not at all. It's, it's the movie, it's not the comic book. Um, so I can honestly say I really can't think of a change. And a lot of the times when a bad comic book movie comes out, you can't point to, oh, this movie was bad because they did this one thing different in the movie than they did in the comic book. No, nah, the bad movies were bad movies because they were bad movies. Um, so I, I can't really answer the question about which one did I hate the most because I, I don't mind it. To me, a filmmaker needs to have the freedom to take that source material and make the best movie they can. And if that means changing a bunch of crap from uh, the original comic book like Joss Whedon has done, like Christopher Nolan has done, uh, like Zack Snyder has done... Um, like, like they all have done, um, then I'm totally fine with it. I have no problem with changing from source material because this isn't the source material. This is the movie. And you do what you need to do. And just I've always said before, just because something works on a printed page and works really well on a printed page does not mean it's going to work well on a screen. They're different mediums. And they'll, they'll have different impacts in different ways. And they'll come across in different ways. And so you got to change it up. And so, no, I will, I will never begrudge a filmmaker for taking a departure from an original comic book. Um, just, not, eh, just, not, just not the way I feel about it. It's totally cool if you feel differently. I'm not trying to belittle your opinion that, that you do have a problem with it. That's cool. I'm just saying it, it's tough for me to answer that question because I don't have a problem with it. All right, last question of the weekend. And that has the privilege and honor of going to... David Stashke, and David writes, with the underwhelming financial performance of the Veronica Mars movie and the Zach Braff's Wish I Was Here, uh, what do you think this means for the future of professional movies funded by Kickstarter? Uh, well, for those of you who don't know what they're talking about, um, recently the Veronica Mars movie was quite well publicized. Um, Veronica Mars, the, the once um, kind, of, kind of modestly hit TV show, uh, got made into a movie, and they funded the movie um, by going to Kickstarter and asking people to donate, and they raised millions and millions of dollars so they can make their movie. Zach Braff, uh, for his movie Wish I Was Here, which might even still be playing in some screens, uh, kind of took the same approach. And they and Zach Braff went to the public, his fans, and said, you know, start a Kickstarter and say, if you'd like <laughs> to see me make this movie, please donate. And people donated millions of dollars, and, and he made his film. I have said this before, I will say it again, uh, and I don't care who likes this and who doesn't, this is the truth. If you are somebody who gives money to a millionaire so that that millionaire can go ahead and make a movie for themselves without taking the financial risk themselves and yet be the only ones to collect the rewards if the movie becomes successful and makes a profit, they're the only ones who keep the money. If you are somebody who donates to that millionaire, you are a sucker. You're a sucker. Um, I have a real problem. I have a major problem with Hollywood professionals, companies, 
millionaires who go, you know, we really want to make this movie. But we don't think it can do so good, so we don't want to pay for it, but I still want to make a movie. I still want to star in this movie. I want to go back to this franchise, or I want to go back to this character. I want to, I want to make this little dream project of mine, but um, I don't think I want to put up my own money for it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I want to pay for it. I'm, I'm a millionaire, but I don't know if I want to risk my millions on making that movie. I know. I'll go to the suckers. I'll go to the dupes. I'll get them to pay for it. So I'm going to make my little Kickstarter video and go, hey guys, remember me, one of your favorite celebrities? Forget the fact that I'm a millionaire for a second. I got a movie I really want to make. I'm really excited about it. Not excited enough to pay for it myself, mind you, but I'm real excited about it. And if you send me a hundred dollars, or twenty dollars, or two hundred dollars, or whatever, I can make this great movie that will change the world. And if it doesn't make any money, no big deal. I don't lose anything. And if it makes fifty million dollars in the box office, I get to keep it all. Hooray! Um, and so, their Kickstarter or their hunt for suckers commence. And the suckers pony up millions of dollars and, um, and send it to these millionaires so they can make their movie. And, you know, it's, it's just really funny. I, I, I just participated in the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge to help raise awareness for, for Lou Gehrig's disease. To try to raise awareness and raise money to help fund the fight against this horrible disease. And what is sad to me is that we got to get us and a lot of people to do something as stupid as douse ourselves in ice water to get people to donate some money to this really worthy cause. But all it takes to get the suckers out is get a celebrity on Kickstarter. Say, hey guys, I'm really excited about this movie. Not excited enough to pay for it myself, mind you, but, but you should pay for it. Send me your money. And suckers, click, how, how can I give the money fast enough? And they send their money to millionaires. People starving. Uh, but, but here's the thing that really bothers me about this, too. Is that you, the, the idea of Kickstarters to help independent creators who do not have the financial resources to bring these creations to life, whether they're technology creations or artistic creations or what have you. The spirit of these types of things like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, things like that, is for these creators to have a way where they would have had no way to get the funding <clears throat> to bring these creations to life, be they technological or artistic. And I think of a friend of mine like John Schnepp. You know, our, our own John Schnepp here on AMC Movie News. You know, he's got this great project. Is Death of Superman Lives, What Happened? John Schnepp is not a millionaire. <laughs> Far from it. John Schnepp can't just reach into his pocketbook and write a check and, and finance his own film. He's not in the position to do that. It's for creators like John Schnepp that Kickstarter is around. And it just frustrates me when I see a creator and an artist like a John Schnepp. Now, granted, I'm biased because Schnepp is a friend of mine. But still, when I see an artist like John Schnepp creating this incredible thing, and he's struggling to reach, you know, the, the $100,000 mark, the $140,000 mark <coughs> to get that film finished, he's still to this day. By the way, look him up online. Go to, uh, Search for The Death of Superman Lives online. And, and he's still trying to raise finishing funds for the film. He's got the trailer out. The trailer's fan-frickin-tastic. But he still needs finishing funds. Go search for it and donate so he can finish that movie. But the thing is, the spirit of things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo is for those creators to make something that they would not otherwise have had the means to do it. And instead, we get these millionaire actors and filmmakers and whatever... Asking the public to pay for their movie, for their little pet project. And the suckers line up and donate in the millions. The millions. Make them pay for it themselves. They have the means. They can pull a check out of their pocket and write it and finance their own damn film. Make them pay for it themselves. If you really want to donate, I know I'm getting preachy about this, and forgive me for that, I apologize, but if you really want to donate to the creative process and the creative arts, then give it to people who don't have a million dollars in their bank account to make it do it themselves. So, David, um, to answer your question is, um, you, what do I think, 
you know, is the future for professional movies funded by Kickstarter? I can tell you this right now. The fact that Veronica Mars and um, uh, Wish I Was Here didn't do so well is only going to encourage these people to go to Kickstarter more. It's like, oh, wow, I, I made this indie film of mine. And, oh, it lost money. Sure, I'm glad I didn't pay for that myself. So it's just going to encourage them to keep going to the suckers. I'm sorry, the donators. Uh, if they're going to keep going back to their public and their fans saying, oh, pay for my next movie. Because I'm really excited about this movie. Once again, not excited enough to pay for it myself. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my, and I ranted on that long enough. Anyway, I believe that was the last question I had thrown at me today. Yes, that was the last question today. Thank you so much for joining me on this installment of AMC Mailbag. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing in AMC theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, your showtime, and of course your movie ticket information. You can also follow us on Twitter at AMC Movie News. Follow us there. And once again, if you've got a topic or a question you want on the show, just email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. So thanks a lot for joining me, guys. I hope you had a magnificent weekend. Can't wait to get going back in the studio again tomorrow for AMC Movie Talk. So my name's John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until next time, bye bye